Hi folks, this should be the first of several of these little uh, lectures on John Milton. Uh, this one on our, oh, political Milton. It matters. He was heavily involved in the politics of the time, and they were a big deal, and it shows up in his writing, particularly in some elements of Paradise Lost. So, let's get started start with a reminder, as we discussed a bit more intentionally in class, in the 1600s, Puritans waged war against King Charles I, deposed him, beheaded him, and established the Protectorate under the General Oliver Cromwell, and they immediately, oh, set about their uh, little uh, agenda. Closed the theaters, cut down the maypoles. Cromwell spent a fair portion of his reign murdering Irish Catholics. He was not involved in the big European Thirty Years' War. Somehow, this first half of the uh, 17th century was a time period in which, well, Europeans decided they should all get together and murder as many of each other as they possibly could over tiny little differences in religious doctrine. Uh, no, I do not understand, but that's quite uh, all right. There's much about humans I don't understand. But uh, so we've got the Calvinists running England and John Milton, who considered himself part of this Calvinist world, wanted to be part of this new government. When we look further into Paradise Lost, we'll note that in certain regards, Milton wasn't a very, very good Calvinist at all. He uh, was, uh, yes, a very staunch believer in free will, but more of that on another one of these things. Meantime, Milton couldn't participate fully in the new government because, well, his lack of uh, vision, physical vision, got in the way. Milton was blind. That's the theme of when I consider how my life is spent. Did write several political tracts, including his defense of the beheading of Charles I. And that's the source of this material. A gentleman named Michael Bryson uh, very conveniently put uh, Milton's writing on this on the, on the web with uh, context. And this matters because Milton offers some arguments, albeit from a different direction, that anticipate John Locke's, uh, Locke's argument in his treatises on uh, civil government, the ones that uh, justified the glorious revolution and the uh, installation of William and Mary at the end of the century. Now, Milton, first of all, asserts that all men are created equal under God. Now, this hierarchy with the king on top and with the uh, nobles below and the three estates and all of the rest of that is pure, unmitigated horseshit. Milton, I think, would have liked the term there. So we'll say it, horseshit. Now, he offers an explanation of kings and magistrates arising and uh, talks about it in terms of necessity. You pick the person who knows what they're doing to uh, lead uh, your army to defend your uh, little uh, old village and stuff like that, and you give them the power to do so and tell everybody to obey because these things have to work right. So, how is he selected? By a democratic or semi-democratic process. The people or the village elders or whatever choose. And the people they choose are supposed to be subject to the law, just like everybody else. But historically, it didn't happen that way, and we know that. And we have all of this stuff, such as King James I's uh, flat-out written assertion, not to mention the notion of the divine right of kings and the absolute right of kings that was prevalent on the uh, continent, particularly in France, and Milton says, no, kings are not chosen by God. They're chosen by men, the reasons we just talked about. So men have the right to put aside even good kings. 
have the right to say, okay, that's enough. It's time for you to move on. We want other things and such as that. Rather like we do with presidents, rather like George Washington way back when saying eight years is enough. It's time for me to set aside myself aside and stuff like that. Now, men also, for more obvious reasons, have the need to put aside tyrants to do them in because tyrants are horrible things. Good men love their independence. They also love good leaders, the ones who are fair and equitable and do things out of necessity and all the rest of that. But corrupt men love tyrants because tyrants can be bribed. Tyrants will do favors for their friends and grant favor. Tyrants allow license. So, foul men love this notion of absolute kings. Good men do not. Okay, now then, Milton's argument, we note, is based on religion and biblical interpretation. It's not like John Locke's argument in that regard, because Locke's is based on the secular philosophy, on the uh, empirical notion of the tabula rasa. But the intent and direction, very much the same. That is, all men are created equal. All men are equal under God. Figures into paradise lost. Now, when Satan establishes his hierarchy in hell, note how he sets himself immediately on top. He calls a parliament, but it's not a parliament of equals. He goes in there, and he's got Beelzebub sitting beside him, and old Beelzebub is going to uh, to do exactly what uh, Satan planned for him to do in advance, and Satan is going to see to it that everything works his way because he is fully establishing himself as the autocrat of hell, as guy on charge, and he's going to stay there. Autocratic, autocratic government, Milton lets us know, is not the will of God, no. It's the product of Satan, it's the product of hell. And so that's a little glance into Milton and politics.